AS and A level biology 9700, component number 1 to Feb March 2023. The photograph show the cell from the human blood smear. Here in this slide, it's given which calculation shows the correct method to calculate the actual diameter of neutrophil. For calculation of actual diameter, we will make here the P and Q distance by in millimeter. This will be our size of image. So this millimeter we will convert into micrometer by multiplying to 1000 and divided by its magnification. So that's is equal to actual size is equal to size of image in millimeter uh, multiplied to 1000 to convert into micrometer divided by magnification. So that's the correct method for calculation of uh, the actual size in micrometer. So A is more relevant, so that's our correct answer. Question number two, a student calibrated an eyepiece reticule using stage micrometer. Now here we have the, the stage micrometer with a known unit, while the eyepiece reticule is below to the stage micrometer with unknown unit. So smallest division of eyepiece reticule we make here with the help of stage micrometer. So for example, here stage micrometer is a given each division of stage micrometer was 0 0.01 millimeter. While the 10 at 10x magnification, the 10 eyepiece reticule unit matches with the 10 division on the stage uh, micrometer. So it means one small unit of eyepiece reticule is equal to one small unit on state micrometer. So here we shall make here the length of the 10 unit of eyepiece reticule, number one. And number two, we shall make here the length of the, the 10 unit of eyepiece reticule at 40x, number two. And then we shall make here the length of 96 eyepiece reticule units. So first, according to this given data, so each division of stage micrometer is equal to 0 0.01 millimeter. Now at 10x magnification, the 10 eyepiece reticule unit is equal to 10 division of stage micrometer. So the length of the 10 unit of eyepiece reticule is equal to 10 unit multiply the smallest, uh, the, the division of the smallest unit of state micrometer, 0 0.01 millimeter. And the answer will be 0 0.1 millimeter is the length of 10 unit of eyepiece reticule at 10x magnification. Now, if you are further magnifying from 10x to the 40x, so we're going to find about the ratio, the 10x ratio 40x. So this will become 1 over 4 or 1 ratio 4. So if you want to find the length of 10 unit of eyepiece reticule at 40x, so we will multiply to 1 over 4 to the length at 10x. So that is 0 0.1 millimeter multiply one over four. So that's is equal to 0 0.025 millimeter. Why we are measuring that the length of 10 eyepiece reticule at, at 40X? Because we measured 96 eyepiece reticule unit at 40X. So that's why we are measuring the length of 10 unit at 40X. Now here, so now we can measure about the length of 10 eyepiece reticule is equal to, at 40x is equal to 0 0.025 millimeter. So the length of the 96 unit will be is equal to x because it's unknown. We're going to find uh, this answer by cross multiplication method. So x is going to multiply with 10 and 96 is going to multiply with 0 0.025 millimeter. So here this will become 10x is equal to 0 0.025 millimeter multiplied to 90, 96. So 10 is multiplying with x, other side it will divide. After solving, we can get this answer 0 0.224 millimeter. We need answer in micrometer, so we will multiply this by 1000 to get 240 micrometer. Our correct answer is C. Which statement are correct for the chloroplast and also for mitochondria? Now, we know that the 
The chloroplast and mitochondria are double membrane bounded organelles. They contain the circular DNA as like bacteria, and they are, they are transcribing the circular DNA into messenger RNA, and they are making their own protein as well. So that's why the statement number one is not correct. The, they contain 80 Swedberg ribosome. So what about here in uh, chloroplast and mitochondria? They contain 70 Swedberg ribosomes are phasing. Well, the number two, they can they can transcribe their circular DNA. Yes, it's correct. They can translate messenger RNA. They can enclose by the double membrane bounded. These are the correct statements. So C is our correct answer here. The electron micrograph shows some cell from the root. So which cell structure is not usually found in the cell from the root? So we can say like some cell, for example, uh, you can see the nucleus a, in the nucleus is, is usually placed in an old cell because it's a eukaryotic organism plant. And the D is a vacuole, that tonoplast uh, vacuole cell membrane that normally plays in an all. So what about cell wall or cell membrane that's placed in an all? So what about the chloroplast is placed in, in the part of the plant which is exposed to the sunlight? So for photosynthesis, what about the root is um, the submerged into the land, there is no availability of sunlight, there's no photosynthesis. So chloroplasts are not present in root hair cell. So that one. The dialysis, the whisking tube is an artificial partially permeable membrane with the pore size is approximately 2.5 nanometer. So one glucose size is 1.5 nanometer. It can easily pass through from there. So what else can pass through from this the whisking tube? So we're going to see that the width size is around 1.5 nanometer. It can pass through. While if it is more than that, so that will not possible. For example, the bacteria is a polymer, uh, the organ organisms that consist of the, uh, the so many proteins and carbohydrates and lipids. So that's why their size is an average of two to eight micrometer in length and two micrometer in diameter. So it cannot pass through from there. While the hemoglobin, the, this is also a polymer because so many different amino acids link together and produce the the large molecule. So this is macromolecule, five nanometer. So it cannot pass. Through. While the ribosomes, they are the two different types. For example, 20 nanometer is in prokaryote, while 25 to 30 nanometer in eukaryote, they cannot pass through. So fractose is an isomer of uh, the glucose. So its diameter is 1.5, so it can easily pass through. So four is our correct answer here. What is present in all viruses? So when we talk about the all different viruses, so virus consists of simple structure. Outermost is a protein coat. So this one is, the, that's our protein coat, while inner is either DNA or RNA. So some viruses contain DNA, some contain RNA. So here, ribose, sugar. So what about the word all is your answer? So this is indication. So ribose, not present in virus having DNA. So the virus which contain the DNA core, they, they have deoxyribose. So that's why it is not present. What about the deoxyribose? It's not present in the viruses which contain RNA core. While the, the thymine is a part of the pyrimidine and it does not present in the virus with the RNA core. So what about in RNA? So thymine is replaced by uracil. So that's why it's not present. While adenine is a part of the, the pyrimidine. So uh, it's, a, it's a part of the, the, the pyrimidine nitrogenous basis. So here, this one is the, the adenine is the part of your the purine. That's the double ring. So it is the part of the purine basis. Now, adenine and there is uh, the guanine. These are the part of uh, the purine basis. So these purine bases, so that's how the double ring, and this is present in all. So they are present in um, the DNA, they are present in RNA. So that's why this is our, the correct answer C. Now to estimate the concentration of the glucose uh, in, uh, in an unknown solution. That's equal volume of, of a range of non-concentration of the glucose 
where each mix with the same excess volume of Benedict solution. After mixing the solution, we put in a thermo uh, thermostatically controlled water bath at 90 degrees Celsius for three minutes. Now the question is, the unknown solution was treated to the same way with the color of uh, the known and unknown solution was compared. Now here the question is, we need to identify the independent variable. So we define independent variable as what the variable which you can uh, you can change experimentally. So and the that type of variable, so other results depend upon this independent variable. For example, here you are changing the concentration, different concentration of the glucose is independent variable. While what type of color will produce, this is the dependent variable. While the variable which remain constant for all these different variable ranges, these are called controlled variable. For example, the temperature is a controlled variable. So here, the concentration of the glucose or different concentration of the glucose selected in which um, the result is dependent, that is our independent variable. While the final color of the solution is a dependent variable because uh, because it is it depends on the different concentration of the sh the sugar, while the temperature of the water bath is a controlled variable and volume of the glucose is a controlled variable because it's constant for all. Which statement are correct for amylose and the amylopectin? These both are the carbohydrate and part of starch and glycogen. So the amylose is a straight chain. It contains only one four glycosidic bond. What about amylopectin is a is contain broad chain structure with a one six glycosidic bond. So number one, they are carbohydrate. It is correct statement. They are formed by condensation reactions. Yeah. So one four glycosidic bond form or one six glycosidic bond formed by condensation reactions. They are linear molecules. So here amylose is a linear, but amylopectin is a non-linear molecule. So that is making one six glycosidic bond and making broth. So it is not correct. They contain alpha one four glycosidic bond, so that's present in both. So our statement one, two, and four, the statements are correct here. So you can see that's a straight chain with the one four glycosidic bond present in both. What about one six glycosidic bond? That is making the bond with the carbon number one and carbon number six. So in this way, that is not present in amylose. Which statement is a correct comparison between saturated triglyceride and unsaturated triglyceride? So to know that the triglyceride, I got uh, one fatty acid chain. So saturated triglyceride contain um, that the single bond between carbon carbon atom in a, in a fatty acid chain. So you can see if there's a single bond is present between carbon carbon atoms, so number of hydrogens are more. What about unsaturated fatty acid? If you're replacing the si single bond with a double bond, so number of hydrogen are, uh, uh, number of hydrogen is decreasing. So here we're gonna see that which statement is correct for. The unsaturated triglyceride have more double bond, it's correct, and few hydrogen atom than the saturated triglyceride. Why? Because if you're replacing the single bond with a double bond, so number of hydrogen uh, bond uh, are decreasing. So A is our correct statement. What about in other statement, they're fluctuating this number. For example, unsaturated triglyceride have fewer double bonds. So they have more double bond. So that one, A is our correct statement here. The diagram represents the molecule from a cell surface membrane. So in a cell surface membrane, there is a, the molecule, the, the bilayers of lipid contain phospholipids. These phospholipids contain hydrophilic head due to the phosphate group, and this contain oxygen with a negative charge, so they are making hydro philic head, while the two fatty acid chain, so this, these are nonpolar and they're making hydrophobic tails. And in this one hydro hydrophobic tail, one is saturated and other would contain double bond, this is unsaturated. So which is the correct statement for that? So which describe of uh, one of the label is the correct. So fatty acid at the hydrophilic end of uh, the molecule. So hydrophilic end of the molecule, so this is not the 
And there's not a hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic end of this uh, the ferrous chain. So two ferrous chain, uh, they are hydrophobic because they are non-polar. Next, the hydrophobic end of triglyceride molecule. So there's not a triglyceride, this is phospholipid. So that's a hydrophobic part of uh, this one. The B is a hydrophobic part of the phospholipid molecule. Now the C is hydrophobic end of the, the glycerol molecule. So what about when we see this? The C, C contains phosphate group. So this is hydrophilic, not hydrophobic. So D is the correct statement. The phosphate group at the hydrophilic end of molecule. So the phosphate group, this is present at the hydrophilic region. D is the phosphate group. So that's present in the hydrophilic uh, region. So this is our correct statement. Which row correctly shows the level of the protein structure that can be held together by each type of the interactions? So when we see that, the hydrogen bond, so this hydrogen bond is present in a secondary structure, is, is designed by the hydrogen bond, and it's present in tertiary and quaternary structure. While the hydrophobic interaction is present in tertiary and quaternary structure, while the covalent bond is present in primary because the particular sequence of amino acid depend upon the specific covalent bond sequence, Second, uh, the, the secondary structure. So when we talk about the secondary structure, so this secondary structure is uh, depend upon hydrogen bond. So there is a hydrogen bond present in the secondary structure produce alpha helix and beta plated sheet. So secondary structure depend upon the hydrogen bond, while the tertiary structure depend upon hydrogen bond, disulfide linkage, covalent bond, ionic bond, hydrophobic interactions. So for example, di the covalent bond is the, the disulfide linkage, so it's also a part. So we're going to see which answer is correct. So hydrogen bond, so the primary structure do not depend upon hydrogen bond. So A is our wrong answer, rest of all are correct. So we're gonna see hydrophobic interactions. So hydrophobic interactions, so primary structure do not depend upon hydrophobic interaction. So that's why A and B both are not correct. In the third, we shall proceed to the C and T. So covalent bond, uh, that's the primary structure depend upon covalent bond. The tertiary structure depend upon covalent bond. What about the secondary structure? It need hydrogen bond only. So alpha helix and beta plated sheet depend upon only the hydrogen bond, not the covalent bond. So that's why the C is our correct answer here. Which molecule contain at least three double bond? So we're going to see that the double bond present, for example, uh, we have a saturated triglyceride. So here, right side, there's a molecule of saturated triglyceride. So this triglyceride contain carboxyl group, and this carboxyl group contain double bond between carbon and oxygen. So that's why these three double bond uh, are present here. Well, the second one, the hemoglobin and collagen. So these are two different type of the protein. Hemoglobin is a globular protein, and collagen fibers are the fibrous protein. So both contain smallest unit amino acid. And these amino acids contain carboxyl group, and there are so many carboxyl group are present in hemoglobin and uh, collagen. So at least three double bond, obviously present in all. So that's why the D is our correct answer here. Which diagram correctly show the hydrogen bond between two water molecules? So we define hydrogen bond as what? The hydrogen bond is attractive forces between partially positive charge on hydrogen atom and partially negative charge on oxygen atom. So when we see that A and D are not correct, why? Because hydrogen is containing the charge like their ions, they're not partially. So that's why A and D are not correct. While the C is not correct because uh, the hydrogen should have a partially positive and oxygen should have a partially negative. What about these opposite charges are mentioned here? The hydrogen having partially negative, so it is wrong. What about the B is the correct? Why? Because oxygen contain partially negative and hydrogen is partially positive. And the force of attraction between these two, uh, the opposite charge atom of two molecules so R is creating hydrogen bond. 
which statement describes an example of extracellular enzymes. So extracellular enzyme means the enzyme which is working outside of the cell. So that is extracellular enzymes. For example, amylase, uh, amylase is a, in a saliva is an enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of starch into maltose and mouth. So it is releasing from the salivary gland into the mouth cavity, and it is explicit this is extracellular enzyme. While carbonic anhydrase that's working inside of the red blood cell, and second DNA polymerase is working in, for the DNA replication inside of the nucleus, or RNA polymerase, this is working inside of the cytoplasm. So all they are working inside of the cell, the A is our correct answer here. Which row is correct uh, for enzyme that it catalyzes the reaction using the lock and key hypothesis? So lock and key hypothesis mean the, the substrate is complementary in a shape to the active side. And during catalysis reaction, there's no change in the shape of the active side because the both are complementary in a shape. So here, um, the A, the low, the effect of enzyme on the activ on the activation energy of the reactions being catalyzed. So the effect of enzyme is to lower the activation energy. So A and B are correct answer or correct statements. So we're going to see that uh, in the second column. The shape of active, active side in uh, comparison to the substrate. So here, the changes to become complementary. So while because in a lock and key hypothesis, active side shape is already complementary to the substrate, so no need to change for that. So that's why the complementary, uh, the active side is already complementary before, during, after the formation of enzyme substrate complex. So that's why the B is our correct answer here. A scientist uh, investigated the rate of breakdown of a hydrogen peroxide. For experiment, uh, four experiments were carried out using the different mixtures. For example, the first experiment with a substrate only. Second experiment with a substrate and enzyme. Third with a substrate enzyme and competitive in inhibitor. And the substrate enzyme and non-competitive inhibitor. So you can see that the first experiment, uh, that one, the substrate plus enzyme only, there's no inhibitor. So this will be number one. While you can see number two is the competitive inhibitor, substrate and enzyme. This is number two. Why? Because when you're increasing the actual substrate concentration, the normal rate of reaction is, get, is, is getting restored. So that's why uh, the non is a competitive inhibitor is affected by the actual substrate concentration. While the non-competitive inhibitor is not affected by actual substrate concentration. So if you're increasing the actual substrate concentration, so non-competitive inhibitor is not affected. So this is number three is with the non-competitive inhibitor. While the number four, the hydrogen peroxide, when we see that hydrogen peroxide is converting into the water and oxygen by itself. So this dissociation is also taking place by itself. So you can see a minor increase is being observing. So it means like there's no uh, enzyme is involved. Number four is that. So we're going to match this statement. Uh, the, there is the B is correctly matching the substrate only. So here the substrate only is number four and substrate plus enzyme plus competitive inhibitor. This is number two is there. So we're going to move to the next question. Which of these substances can pass directly through the cell surface membrane without using carrier protein or a channel protein? So there are only gases, small molecules like carbon dioxide and water and uh, small quantity of water and the oxygen. So all gases, you can say carbon dioxide and oxygen, they can directly diffuse across the plasma membrane. And some uh, lipids are there. They can also directly diffuse by the phospho phospholipid bilayer. So here, so this is carbon dioxide is a small inorganic molecule. It can easily diffuse across the plasma membrane. What about the calcium ion? These are the charge. They need the protein channel or carrier, while the glucose can only move by facilitated diffusion or active transport by carrier or channel. So number two is our 
correct answer here. So this one is the D is our correct answer. What happened to the surface area to the volume ratio of a cube when the length of each side is doubled? For example, uh, we're going to take there's so one cube with the, uh, with the length is two centimeter each. So uh, if you're going to double to the four centimeters, so what will be effect? For example, two centimeters is a length. So if you want to find the surface area, so surface area will become two multiplied two, this will become four centimeter, four centimeter square. So uh, what about the surface area of six side will become six multiply four, that's 24. The volume of each small cube is equal to length multiply width multiply height, that is 8. So 24 divided by 8, so this is becoming ratio 3, ratio 1. So if you're going to double it, for example, this will become 4 centimeter, 4 centimeter, 4 centimeter, length, width, and height. So in this way, this will become one side, 16 centimeter cube. So 16 multiply 6, this will become 96. And what about volume is 64. So 96 divided by 54, it is becoming 1.5 ratio 1. So you can see, original ratio was three ratio one so here now now the surface area has been reduced to half so that's why if you're increasing the size surface area to volume ratio is decreasing to half if you double the size surface area to volume ratio will become half so here the ratio decreased by four times it's four times is wrong uh, the ratio will become half. So B is our correct statement why because their ratio will become surface area to volume ratio will become half which event are the part of mitotic cell cycle? So mitotic cell cycle um, is consists of the first, the, the interface and interface, there is a G1 and G2 and G0, and there is the S phase. So normally it's moving G1 coming to the S phase and then G2 phase. What about in M phase, the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase all are coming in a sequence. So we're going to see that the interphase is also a part of the mitotic cell cycle because he's saying all, he's not saying M cycle, he's saying mitotic cell cycle. So in a cell cycle, interphase is also included, telophase is also included, cytokinesis is also included, means cytoplasm division. So that's A is our correct answer here. The estimated and the total number of red blood cells in the human body is 2.5 in a 10 raised to about 13. These are the total number of the red blood cells. It is estimated that a day, the 2.5 in a 10 raised to about 11 red blood cells are removed from the circulations and are replaced by the stem cell in a bone marrow. So what percentage of a total number of red blood cells is replaced each day? So for that, we're going to calculate, for example, the given value 2.5 into 10 raised to the power 11 divided by 2.5 into 10 raised to the power 13. Total number multiplied into the 100. Our answer is coming 1%. So C is our correct answer here. The DNA polymerase catalyzes the condensation reactions between the molecule during the semi-conservative replications of the DNA. So semi and that, that's a semi-conservative replication, mean uh, the DNA polymerase enzyme is responsible to make a phosphodiester bond between the, the different nucleotide for semi-conservative replication. So what is joined by DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase, you can see there are two nucleotides are there. One is in the red color. This is uh, the guanosine tri, guanosine monophosphate is there. So this one is a one nucleotide and there is a second nucleotide. So now these two nucleotides are connected by phosphodiester bond and who's making this? This is DNA polymerase. Now here, the A is base to base, and also there's a hydrogen bond present between base. You can see guanine and cytosine, adenine and thymine hydrogen bond, so it is not catalyzed by DNA polymerase. While base and nucleotide, there's a hydrogen bond star present, so there is a one base and other nucleotide are connected to both strain by the hydrogen bond. Well, the phosphate and the ribose, so there is a phosphate group and the ribose sugar, so ATP synthase is responsible to make this type of the bond for making nucleotide, so that's why RNA DNA, um, DNA polymerase is not involved. So DNA polymerase is making nucleotide to nucleotide connection phosphodiester bond. So C is our correct answer here. The two polynucleotide strain make up the DNA molecule. So which description is correct here? 
So the percentage of cytosine is now you can see like uh, here the the percentage of cytosine is fifty percent of the, the guanine. So you can see guanine is coming opposite cytosine and adenine is complementary to the thymine. So whatever the quantity of the guanine in one strain, there will be same quantity or same percentage of the cytosine in another strain. So in this way, overall, their percentage will be same. Their number will be same. So that's why here is saying the cytosine is 50%. So 50% is wrong. There's the same, same quantity, I mean 100% of is like the guanine. So percentage of cytosine is same. A is the guanine in a full molecule. So that's the same. Uh, this is B is our correct statement. While the percentage of the cytosine is same to the guanine each strain. So in each strain, they are, they are different, obviously. So because they are present on two different strain, two opposite strain. So that's why their overall percentage will be same on the opposite strain, not on each strain. So B is our correct statement here. The PDX1 is a protein that's fine, uh, that's fine in a wide range of animal species, where it's regarded to essential for normal metabolism. Now, in ascend rates, the gene coding for PDX1 protein has much lower proportion of uh, adenine and thymine nucleotide. So it means in uh, send, uh, send rates, so, so the percentage of A, uh, adenine and thymine is less. So obviously guanine and cytosine will be more. So finding the complete DNA sequence of uh, the PDX1 gene in a send rate has been difficult sequence involve uh, splitting of nucleotide at one time from single strain. So if you want to uh, if you want to study the, the DNA strain, we have to convert the double strain into a single strain. For this conversion, we need to break the hydrogen bond between thymine and adenine is a two hydrogen bond, while the guanine and cytosine, they are the three hydrogen bond. So that's why breaking the three hydrogen bond is more difficult as compared to the two, uh, the hydrogen bond. So that's why the ratio of uh, the triple hydrogen bond mean guanine and cytosine is present in send rate is more as compared to other animal. So that's why it is difficult. So we're gonna see that which statement is describing that. For example, the PDX1 gene is present in only a small proportion of the nuclei. Now see, all genes are present in a small proportion of the nuclei. So that's why it's not de describing this statement. Uh, the PDX1 gene is transcribed in only some cell. So yeah, so some, some genes are active in a different cell. These are the cell differentiation. So it is common for all. So this is not related to this uh, analysis or this experimental approach. While the strength of the hydrogen bond between two strain of the PDX1 gene is usually high. So the statement number three is correctly describing what is the problem actually to convert the double helix into single helix structure. So in this way, that's because the strength of the triple uh, hydrogen bond is more high as compared to the double. So that's why the three is our correct statement. So D is our correct answer. D is our correct answer here. Different tissues in a plant were in the slide with the uh, was supplied with the radioactive label substance to identify which tissue were actively synthesizing messenger RNA. So, which radioactively labeled substance would be suitable for this experiment? Now, here question is messenger RNA. So, we need to supply that type of radioactive that type of the radioactive substance like this into that that chemical which should only present in messenger RNA. If it's present in both messenger RNA and DNA, DNA, so we won't able to identify. So that's why you can see uh, adenine um, also also used in the DNA formation. So adenine is also present in the DNA. While the uracil, it's only present in RNA. So that's why uh, the radioactively labeled uracil will help us to easily identify the position of messenger RNA. While the inorganic phosphate, uh, this inorganic phosphate um, used in a both RNA and DNA phosphorylation. So that's why it is present in both. While the ribose sugar, that's present only in RNA, not in DNA. So we can uh, easily identify this. Number two and number four are correct statement. So the C is our correct answer here. 
which row correctly matches the structure and the function of the flowing sieve tube element. So flowing sieve tube element is uh, the structure, mean peripheral cytoplasm with no nucleus. This is a correct statement. There is uh, the peripheral cytoplasm is present, no nucleus. It helps the easily the transport of photosynthetic product. So to provide a little resistance to flow is uh, possible. So A is our, the correct statement because uh, that's both columns are correct. What about in B, you can see the end wall modifies um, to form the C plate. So here is slow down the rate. So it's not slowing down rate. It function is to prevent flow of the cytoplasm and providing strength. What about uh, the elongated cell? So these elongated cell, they are transporting uh, sucrose and amino acid, not mineral iron and water, because it's taking place in, in, in xylem, while the cellulose cell wall uh, with no lignin. So uh, this cellulose, uh, this prevent the loss of water. So cellulose, um, there is a, that's not uh, using for prevent, it's used to withstand with a high hydrostatic pressure. So that's why the A is our correct statement. Which feature of a xylem vessel element helps to adhesions during transpirations? So which feature is describing the adhesive property? For example, we can see, uh, number one, the lignin forms a complete secondary cell wall. So when we see that the secondary cell wall and the lignin is not present in the secondary cell wall formation, uh, secondary cell wall form usually in the cellulose and hemicellulose are present in that. So that's why it's wrong. Uh, wrong answer here. So new cell, new vessels carry extra water uh, as the plant grows. Now it's not explaining the adhesive property of water. So that one, there are no cross wall between the uh, the vessels element. So if there is a no cross wall, so this no cross wall. If there is a no cross wall, so this will decrease the adhesive property for the transpirations. So that's why uh, the the D is our correct uh, statement. The vessel element form narrow tube. So if there's a narrow tube, this is providing of the capillary reaction. This capillary reaction is basically providing more surface area and uh, less gravitational weight, so or less inertia for water in between. So in this way, the water can easily cling to the wall around and can easily approach to adhesive property. So that's why the D is our correct statement here. The massive flow in the bulk movement of the material from one place to another place. So mass flow method is uh, how many of these vessel listed carry fluid by mass flow method. So mass flow method is described like the bulk movement of the material, like you know, the, the inorganic and organic sort, they're dissolved in the water and they're moving from one place to another place in a solution form. That's on the mass flow method. So you can see in the artery, that's also describing the same, like uh, the food and oxygen and waste material all are dissolved into the blood plasma and moving. So it's correct. The flame is dissolving the sucrose and amino acid while veins they contain the waste material or some other the hormones so while the xylem the water and the minerals so all dissolve in the water and moving in the form of the solution so four are correct statement here the cellulose lignin and subgreen are the component of various cells so these are the component of the various cells so we need to identify so description of these cell wall components are listed. For example, a component of a casparian, uh, casparian strips. These casparian strips, uh, they're facing in, in uh, around the endodermis and they are subrene wax. And their function is to prevent the loss of water and uh, protections from infections of uh, invasion of microorganisms. So that's why uh, the water has to change its route from a plastic pathway to sim plastic pathway where Caspanian strips are coming. So Caspanian strips are related with wax. That's a subrene wax. Second, redirect the water into a sim plastic pathway. So as we studied like Caspanian strips, when they will come and uh, in this way, the subrene wicks will come. So apoplastic pathway, the, if the water is moving from cell wall to cell wall, it will redirect into cytoplasm to cytoplasm uh, by plasmodus way or by the cytoplasmic interactions. So this is our the 
Supreme Vex as well. What about number three, hydrophobic component of uh, the cell wall. So hydrophobic component is lignin. The lignin is not soluble in the water, so that's a hydrophobic. It prevents the escape of water. Next is the water interact with the with this molecule in an apoplastic pathway. So this is basically the cellulose. Uh, it can interact with the water and making uh, like adhesive property. So cellulose has an adhesive property and water can easily move from cell wall to the cell wall. So here, the correct statement is our cellulose is a four, lignin is a three, and subrin wax is one or two. So here, the D is our correct statement here. Second question is related to above concept. The arrow show the direction of a water movement across the plant root. Uh, from the water in the soil to the xylem. So you can see that the water is moving uh, from the soil to the xylem. So here there's a movement, I mean, number two and number four are exact movement of uh, the apoplastic pathway, cell wall to cell wall. While uh, number, number three and number one, five, seven, eight, and six are the sim uh, are their symplastic movement in which the cell is entering into the cytoplasm. What about you can see the Casparian strips that are present in, in the endodermis, so to prevent the the movement of water in apoplastic pathway. So water has to redirect itself in the number six into the cytoplasm due to the presence of Casparian strips. So which rows, which arrow show the water movement only in the apoplastic pathway. So only is a moving in number two and number four, cell wall to cell wall only. Which row correctly identify the so sucrose or the sources and sink of the sugar? So which rose is describing this, the sources and sink? So sources, what the storage cell of the seed provide nutrient for growth. So when we talk about the storage cell, so that is the, the best source. What about the root cell that's absorbing the mineral ion? So the root cell is absorbing only the mineral ion and there's no food. So in this way, the food is coming from the source. So that's why it is sink. So A is the sink and the storage cells are providing food. These are sources. Photograph show the sections through the tissue with the artery. So here there is a the tissue is being given there. Now when we observe about this tissue, so you can get some idea related to that. For example, this tissue, there's a so many spongy structures are given there. So these many sac like spongy structures, they indicate this there are so many alveoli are patient. So this is lung tissue. Now, inside of the lung tissue, we have pulmonary artery. Now, this pulmonary artery contains deoxygenated blood because it's, it's coming from the right side of the heart, from right ventricle to pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery to the lungs. So that's why it is deoxygenated blood is present. What about this artery? Obviously, it's an artery. It has to withstand with a high uh, hydrostatic pressure or high blood pressure is coming from heart. So that's why it is uh, muscular. So that's why we're going to see that these characters are visible. So we're going to find an answer for these questions. So which row correctly show the type of artery and whether the blood inside of this artery is oxygenated or deoxygenated? So the type of artery is what? That is muscular artery. And second is the blood, uh, the deoxygenated blood, because it's coming from right side of the heart and it is basing in the the lungs for oxygenation, so that is deoxygenated blood. The heart surgery may cause a decrease in the transmissions of impulses in perkine tissues to the right side of the heart. So what is the possible effect of this decrease? So when you see that, for example, the heart anatomy, so the heart anatomy is working with uh, two types of uh, the pacemakers. And number one, we have a sinoatrial node, which is giving electric supply to only atria, while the atrioventricular node, uh, which is uh, connected with the sinoatrial node only, and there's a minor delay between the 
sinoatrial node impulses to the atrioventricular node impulses. And this atrioventricular node give electric supply to the porcine tissues, porcine fiber. They are penetrated into a ventricle wall and this cause the ventricle contractions. Now here are questions. The impulses would be delayed by the atrioventricular wall. So there's already natural delay between, naturally there's a delay. First atria contract and then ventricle contract. So that's why there is a minor delay present between sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node impulses. So the muscle of the right ventricle will contract slightly more slowly then to the muscle of left ventricle. So when we see that, uh, for example, uh, the heart surgery may decrease the transmission of impulses of perkine tissues to right side. So if the impulses are decreasing or transmission of impulses are decreasing, so the contraction will be comparatively slow. So that is the B is our correct statement. What about the, the C? So muscle of the right atrium would not contract A is the fully the muscle of the left atrium. So both atrium will contract at the same rate. Why? Because there is no impact is being visible in the question statement. So that's why the both atria will contract at the same, same rate while the sinoatrial node would transmit the fewer impulses. Now, sinoatrial node is not related with the ventricle the part. It's only related to the atrium part of the heart. So B is our correct statement here. The diagram show the, the network of the blood vessels that, that supply the blood to the muscle tissue in a human body. So here first we have an artery, this artery divided into arteriole, so that's arterial part and then it's a capillary region. And this capillary region joined together by vineal and vineal will enter into vein. So when we see that, the, the structure which is present inside of uh, the artery, so arterial region, there's a high blood pressure and high water potential of present in artery region. Why? Because uh, the blood is directly coming from a heart and there's a high pressure. And when this blood will enter into the capillary region, so due to narrow diameter of the capillary, there will be fraction in the wall of the capillary and the pressure will decrease. The water will come out from inside to the outside. So in this way, the water potential will decrease already in the capillaries. So that's why the correct statement, the blood, vessel, blood pressure in X as compared to the blood pressure in Y. So this is going to be higher. So blood in X, blood pressure in X is higher as compared to the capillary and water potential of the blood at X compared with the water potential of blood in Y. So this is going to be higher in X. Why? Because from X, the water will go out. So only larger protein like fibrinogen, globulin, and so many other larger protein will stay. They cannot escape. So that's why the water potential in X will be greater as compared to Y. So C is our correct statement here. The scientists have shown the oxygen dissociation curve. So for the hemoglobin of smaller mammal are to the right of those of the larger mammal. So we can, we can see this, for example, uh, if you have the, the oxygen dissociation curve. This oxygen dissociation curve, the smaller member is a right side. It means it needs a more substrate. So its affinity for hemoglobin is decreasing if it is going to or dragging to the more right side. So that's why uh, the statement at the low partial pressure of oxygen, it bind up to the oxygen more strongly. So it's basically, if it has a less affinity with oxygen, why? Because this curve is to the right side, so its affinity with oxygen is decreasing. So that's why it has less strongly bind. So it will bind less strongly at low partial pressure of oxygen. Now, if it, uh, it saturate with oxygen at low partial pressure. Now, these smaller mammal, if this curve is moving to the right side, it means this affinity is decreasing. So it need a high partial pressure to get saturated. So number C, it releases oxygen more easily than to the hemoglobin of a larger mammals. So if it's uh, the affinity with oxygen is decreasing, so due to the low affinity, it can easily unload oxygen. Why? Because the smaller mammal has a low affinity with the hemoglobin. So oxygen affinity, but the hemoglobin is less, so it can easily release that. So the C is our correct statement here.
So when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, it carries more oxygen. So when there is a partial pressure is high, so due to low affinity, it will carry low oxygen. So that one, uh, it carries less oxygen comparatively. So that's why the C is our correct statement here. What is an effect of an increase, the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the blood? So when we see that uh, an increase in the movement of a chlorine ion out of the red blood cell. So the carbon dioxide, when it will enter into the red blood cell, it will combine with the, the water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase that produce carbonic acid. Now this carbonic acid will dissociate into a hydrogen carbonate ion. It will move from inside to outside, while chlorine will move from outside to inside. While the hydrogen ion, they will combine with the hemoglobin and produce hemoglobinic acid. So the statement, increase the movement of chlorine ion out. So it's not out, it's basically in. So how many number of the hydrogen carbonate ion will move from inside to the outside? Chlorine will move from outside to inside. So second, increase the concentration of the hemoglobinic acid. So B is our correct statement. Why? Because uh, how many number of uh, the hydrogen carbonate or carbonic acid will increase? More hydrogen ion will produce. These proton or hydrogen ion will directly combine with the hemoglobin and produce hemoglobinic acid. So B is our correct statement here. The two of the requirement of an uh, efficient gas exchange system are the large surface area and the short diffusion distance. So which role correctly describe how the alveoli is adopted to provide these characteristics? For example, the large surface area. So alveoli are folded and the interconnected with each other. So these, there are so many folds and they are increasing the surface area. What about the short distance? So wall of alveoli are only one cell thick. So due to this one cell thick, so they are providing the, the thin surface area. So there is an equal diffusion is taking place. So C is correctly describing these two characteristics. So that's why the C is our correct answer. What about if you see that in A, uh, elastic fiber is not describing the large surface area or gas dissolved in a layer of liquid, it's not describing the large surface area. And in the same way, the D, the wall of alveoli are formed of squamous epithelium. So if there's a squamous epithelium or columnar cell, so it's not directly uh, describing the, the large surface area. So what about the uh, short distance? Red blood cell are very close to the capillary. So they are also describing the short distance. So uh, in the both column, the C is our correct statement here. What define the infectious diseases? So infectious diseases are what? The disease caused by pathogen. And these pathogens are maybe virus, bacteria, fungus, through the direct or indirect contact from infected person to the host or non-infected person. So what define infectious diseases? So the symptom caused by a bacteria. So only bacteria is not causing the infectious diseases. Uh, so it may be by the bacteria, virus, or fungus. So that's why this is not um, the covering the whole definitions of the infectious diseases. So the symptom caused by the pathogen that is transmitted by one host to another host. So that's why this is kind of the general statement. And the pathogen is a type of a term which is covering the, all these infectious particles or infectious agent. For example, the virus, bacteria, then the fungus or microproteins or DNA or RNA infectious particle. So the pathogen is covering all these type of terms. So that's why it is our microorganism. This is covering all these type of the term. So this is our the, the, the correct statement. So symptoms are caused by the pathogen that is transmitted from one host to another host. While the C statement is the, the symptom is caused by microorganisms that carry a vector. So the, the infection may pass from so many other different ways, not only, the, not only by vector method. So that's why it is wrong statement. Uh, in the same way, the D, the symptoms are caused by a virus. So multiple type of the pathogens are there. So that's why it is also not a correct statement. 
Now, a hurricane destroyed a larger town on an island, so the people may move away from the town and set up the, the tents and where the sanitation is poor. So the drinking water and other the sanitation water system is, is mixing. So whenever there is a poor sanitation, so there is a chance of mixing of a drinking water and a sanitation water. So which disease is the most likely to spread within a week of uh, the change in the living conditions? So if there is a change in a living condition, so obviously the poor sanitation will contaminate the drinking water. So there's a disease that's cholera. So it's caused by Vibrio cholera, which is present in contaminated sanitation water. So when it will mix with the drinking water due to the, the natural catastrophic event like earthquake or the flooding or tsunami, so this will uh, erupt in a large amount, that is cholera. So A is our correct statement. Which statement correctly explain why the viruses are affected by, uh, are, are unaffected by penicillin? So the, the penicillin is a type of antibiotic and it is affecting the bacteria which contain the cell wall. So it, it works as enzyme inhibitor, which is responsible to make the cell wall of the bacteria. While the viruses do not have the, the cell wall, so that's why it is not affected. So penicillin only affect whole cell metabolism. So no, the, the penicillin only affect the cell wall formations and penicillin only bind to the enzyme which is making the cell wall of the bacteria. So that's why B is our the incorrect statement. So D is our correct statement that penicillin only block peptidoglycan synthesis. So peptidoglycan is what the cell wall of the bacteria and uh, it's working as an enzyme inhibitor to block the enzyme, which is responsible to make the cell wall of the bacteria. So that's why the D is our correct statement here. So penicillin only block the messenger RNA in uh, protein synthesis. So it's not uh, blocking the transcription, it's only blocking the cell wall formations. Which process characterize the mode of actions of a phagocytes? So what are the mode of action of a phagocyte? For example, number one, uh, antibody productions, that one. And uh, the, the mode of action of a phagocyte is what? The, the, the phagocyte is characterized to phagocytosis. So it is engulfing the microorganism, which are pathogen, which contain non-cell antigen on their surface. So the, the process of phagocyte uh, that's binding with the receptor, first it will bind with the receptor binding protein. Second, uh, it engulf, it go around that, the infectious particle and perform endocytosis, and then it digest it by process hydrolysis, and then it release it waste material out by exocytosis. What about the antibody production? It's a function of lymphocyte. So antibody um, are produced by the lymphocyte, B and T lymphocyte are responsible, especially the B lymphocyte, they are pr producing plasma cell and they are producing antibodies. So that's why uh, the here in our two, three, four, five are the correct statement. So C is our correct answer here. We have completed this uh, this paper. Hopefully, it will be uh, helpful for you. If you find further any doubt in a question, so you can write in a comment box. I will individually explain that question for you. Thank you. Thank you very much.